Welcome and good morning. I'm Kay Cotton, the Candidate and Voter Services Manager at the Registrar Voters Office. Thank you for joining us today for this ballot designation webinar. I want to make sure that all of you see on your screen our first slide, which says Orange County Registrar of Voters Ballot Designation Webinar. If not, please let me know now. We want to make sure that we don't have any technical problems. Okay, I guess we're fine. Um, I know you're all aware making a decision concerning whether to accept a ballot designation is not always a black or white choice. There's many regulations and factors that need to be considered, and hopefully today's webinar presentation will make the decision making easier for you and not as confusing. There's a few housekeeping items that I want to mention. In case you get disconnected, use the email address you received from us to rejoin the presentation. And if you need to leave the presentation or your desk, please do not put us on hold, particularly if you have a system with music. Uh, we'll all be listening to the music until you return. I know you'll have questions, and if you want to ask a question, please do so electronically rather than verbally. And to do this, all you have to do is click on the Q&A icon that's in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, uh, and then hit. Um, you'll go to hit the icon, type in your question, and hit enter. And we'll run, respond to your question sometime during the presentation. We're also providing you with some handouts that you can download at the end of the presentation, but if you want to refer to them earlier, feel free to do so by clicking on the icon in the upper right side of your screen, uh, right next to the feedback icon. Uh, the icon looks like several pages. Click on that, and a menu will appear that has five uh, handouts, and then you can just click on the one that you want to look at. I'd like to introduce you to the staff members of the Candidate and Voter Services team. I'm sure most or all of you have had contact with Marcia Nielsen. Marcia is the lead of the CBS team and is the liaison with the cities for candidate filing. And this includes candidate statements and today's subject ballot designations. Um, I do want to mention that if you have any questions pertaining to ballot measures, please uh, contact me for those issues. Here are the other members of our team. And if Marcia and I are not available, feel free to contact them. Uh, the number is 714-567-7600. Jessica Castaneda is the alternative voting specialist. Uh, Jessica is responsible for processing the vote-by-mail applications and sending those ballots to the voters. Evelyn Bell is the voting registration specialist. She issues voter registration affidavits to individuals and to organizations. Christina Avila is our campaign disclosure filing officer. She handles all the campaign finance documents. Deborah Sanchez is an office assistant who assists Christina with the campaign finance documents. Carl Crescio is an office assistant who assists with the registration affidavits and the vote by mail applications. And last but not least is Sherry Alvarado. Uh, Sherry's a temporary office assistant that we have here during our um, June election, and she's helping all of us. Now it's time to start the presentation, and I'm going to turn it over to Marcia. Good morning. I would like to welcome you as you join us today in the first Registrar of Voters webinar. It is kind of exciting to have this kind of forum to communicate with one another. I know that it might seem a bit early to even be thinking about ballot designations, let alone discussing them, but as we all know, candidates filing is just around the corner. To give you a little background on myself, I have been responsible for candidate filing for a little over 11 years. Um, some of the ballot designations that have pre been presented to me, and there have been several, some of them are very clear and others are a little more ambiguous. When I begin to prepare for this process, the first thing that I do is review the Secretary of State's ballot designation regulations. This document becomes like scripture to me because it addresses the rules that govern this ever-important topic. Today, we'll be focusing on the basic rules for determining ballot designations. A ballot designation must be the principal profession, occupation, or vocation of a candidate. The next rule is that a ballot designation cannot be misleading. Third, there is a three-word limitation. The use of the words incumbent and appointed incumbent also have rules that are governed in the Secretary of State's ballot designation regulations. 
The next rule is the use of geographical names. The use of the word retired is also something that we'll discuss. Statuses. And lastly, the use of community volunteer. The first question to ask your candidate is, is this your principal profession, occupation, or vocation? This is a question that I ask more than just the first time that we meet, because it's the answer to this and what they reference on the ballot designation worksheet lets you know whether or not a specific designation is acceptable or not. So let's define the word principle. The term principle precludes any activity not entailing a significant involvement on the part of the candidate. And this is the key phrase. The activity is the primary, main, or leading profession, vocation, or occupation of the candidate. The ballot designation must accurately state the candidate's current principal, profession, vocation, or occupation. And another component is that it must be factually accurate and not be confusing or misleading. So sometimes there are designations that fit the three-word um, requirement, and it is something that they do partially, but the actual words themselves, you need to look at carefully to make sure that they wouldn't be confusing or misleading to the voters. And that seems like it should be simple enough, but as those of you that have experience in this, no, it's not that easy. It's not always as easy as it sounds. So can a candidate use multiple principal professions, occupations, or vocations? Well, possibly. It all depends on what they are. Each one of the designations needs to be considered independently. How much time does the candidate spend doing the requested designation? Is it current? Is it accurate? If the answer to these questions is yes, then multiple designations can be used. If a candidate chooses to use multiple designations, the proposed ballot designation still must adhere to the three-word limitation. The only exception to this is in the title of elected officials, which we will discuss later in our presentation. So, what can a candidate do? What can the candidate do if they don't have a occupation, a current principal, profession, vocation, or occupation? There we are. Um, and sometimes this is the case. If someone's recently been laid off, let's say um, somebody had been employed most of the year but just was laid off from their job a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago. If a candidate is currently unemployed and he or she has had a principal occupation, profession, or vocation in the last 12 months, then they are able to use that profession. An example of this would be, let's say, John Smith is a candidate. He comes to the counter. He wants to use the word firefighter as his occupation. He lets you know that he currently hasn't been working one for the last four months. But if he has done so within the last year, then he can use firefighter as an acceptable designation. We thought that it might be helpful to have some short quizzes throughout the presentation. We will present different scenarios and possible ballot designations. We want you to think in your mind, either thumbs up or thumbs down. After the questions, we'll follow up with the answers and explanations. Let's see if we're all on the same page. Our first example is a very busy candidate for Garden Grove City Clerk. She is the CEO of Acme Widgets and teaches a course in early American pottery three nights a week at the local university. She is also a prize-winning competitive disco dancer. She is the wife of a prominent U.S. Senator and the mother of two children adopted from Bangladesh. She would like to use as her designation CEO forward slash educator forward slash dancer. Can she do this? And this one, the second option is educator forward slash mother. Okay, so thumbs up or thumbs down. What do you think? Well, for the first uh, requested designation, 
CEO forward slash educator forward slash dancer. Well, it could be either a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And sometimes this is often the case. Each of these designations that are being requested must satisfy, satisfy the definition of principal. Then, in this case, then it would be acceptable. If, for example, the dancer is just a casual activity or something that she really enjoys doing, then it's unacceptable as a ballot designation. For B, the second designation, educator forward slash mother. Again, this could be either a thumbs up or a thumbs down, depending upon whether the designations are principal. As long as the designations are otherwise acceptable, a candidate can select from his or her various professions, locations, and occupations in choosing a ballot designation. I thought it was interesting that mother is acceptable, but wife is not because it represents a status. The next three, the next basic rule is the three word limitation and the one big exception. Let's review the word counting um, by the Secretary of State's definition. This is something that you'll find in the Secretary of State's ballot designation regulation, and it states simply, a ballot designations may only be three words, but that the three words um, can be derived from the names of county, state, and cities. They are all considered one word. There are some examples that are listed here. Huntington Beach, or the city of Huntington Beach, is counted just as one word. The same is true of Orange County and County of Orange, or California and State of California. Another example is Sunny, uh, City of Huntington Beach Traffic Commissioner. I know it seems like there are a lot of words there, but if you really break it down, the City of Huntington Beach is just one word. Traffic is considered another, and Commissioner would be the third word. So this would be acceptable, unless, of course, there is another principal occupation. So a little bit more discussion on the big exception. Candidates that hold elective city, county, district, state, or federal office may use as his or her ballot designation the elective office which the candidate holds at the time of filing his or her nomination documents. An example of this is city councilman, councilman city of La Habra, or city of La Habra councilman. They can use this elective title if they're running for the same office, or they can use it if they're running for a different office. An example of this would be if we had, say, Jane Smith come to the counter. She was currently the city attorney of Huntington Beach, which is an elective office. If she wanted to run for a city council instead, she could still use city attorney, comma, city of Huntington Beach. This would be an accurate ballot designation. We now have another example. A candidate for a placenta city council is currently a California state assemblyman for the 70th district and holds that office at the time he files his nomination papers for city council. He also owns a ranch on which he raises horses and grows oranges. He wants his ballot designation to be California state assembly member forward slash rancher. Can he use this designation? How about California State Assembly Member? For the last request, Assembly Member forward slash rancher. What do you think? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? Well, for the first request, California State Assembly Member forward slash rancher. Well, that's a thumbs down because it's too many words. If he wants to use his complete official title and have the word limitation not be applicable, then he needs to have California State Assembly member, which was the choice for B. It must stand alone. Therefore, B is thumbs up, because California State Assembly member is acceptable. Now the third choice, C, Assembly member forward slash rancher. This is also thumbs up. And this is a good example of how candidates combine elected offices with other occupations. It gives the voters um, another aspect of, of their lives and what they do with their time. 
We have another short quiz here. This is a candidate for the San Juan Capistrano City Council that's currently the elected district attorney in the county of Orange. In her spare time, she makes kites and sells them at craft fairs two or three times a year. She would like to use district attorney, comma, county of Orange, forward slash, businesswoman. What do you think? This one is a thumbs down, and you can probably immediately tell that it is so because it has too many words. The exception to the word limitation for the official titles doesn't apply in this example because she wants to combine it with another occupation, businesswoman. She could drop the word businesswoman from it, and then it would be acceptable, but she can't use businesswoman by itself because this isn't her principal occupation, profession, or vocation. She only sells her products two or three times a year. So this brings up another point. If a candidate wants to use their elective office in conjunction with another occupation, then they somehow must make it adhere to the three-word limitation. When to use the words incumbent or appointed incumbent? The Secretary of State's guidelines define incumbent as a person that's a candidate for the same office which he or she holds at the time of filing and was elected to that office by a vote of the people. One of the rules of using the word incumbent is that it must be used as a noun. It can't ever be used as an adjective. And it also must stand alone. I'm often asked this question um, by candidates at our counter and, and by some of you, whether it's something that they have to use. If they're the incumbent, do they have to use incumbent? Or do they have to use city councilman, city of La Habra? And the answer to that is no. They can use something completely different if they would like that reflects their accurate depiction of a principal occupation, profession, or vocation. But they do have the option of using either. It's just that if they were going to use incumbent, they can't add anything else with that. And they often try to do that. So use of the phrase appointed incumbent. Now, it's sometimes a little confusing. But if they are an incumbent that is holding an office because they were appointed to that office, as opposed to being elected by the electorate, then they need to use the phrase, the word appointed, before the word incumbent. And this is also true in the case of, of um, the incumbent that wants to file for a different office. Let's say the uh, city council person wants to run for mayor. They could put appointed in, uh, well, they couldn't put appointed incumbent in that case. They'd have to put appointed uh, city council member. So that would be an accurate depiction of, of what they're doing. And here we have an example of the ballot designation incumbent and appointed incumbent. So let's see how well you do. A candidate for Brea City Council is currently a member of that city council, having been appointed to the remainder of a term of a city council member who resigned. He wants to use the ballot designation of incumbent. Can he do so? Or how about councilman, comma, city of Brea? The third choice is appointed incumbent. And lastly, appointed councilman, city of Brea. I know that's quite a few of them to remember, so let's go through them one at a time. Can he use incumbent? No. He needs to add the word appointed since he wasn't elected. He was appointed by the city council. So on the second choice, councilman, city of Brea, he can't use that either because he also needs to reference that he was appointed. So that's a thumbs down. For the third choice, appointed incumbent. That's perfect. That's exactly what he is. His other option would be D, appointed councilman, city of Brea. That would be, that would work too. Our next example is a candidate for California State Senate that's currently the mayor of Los Alamitos. He was appointed to the position by the Los Alamitos City Council. He also owns the local such and such car wash and coaches peewee soccer for his son's team. The candidate wants to use incumbent mayor forward slash businessman. 
Can he do this? How about incumbent mayor? Or what about mayor, comma, city of Los Alamitos? Or what about mayor, forward slash, businessman? Again, I know that's quite a lot of choices there. So let's start at the top. Incumbent mayor, businessman. This is a thumbs down. Incumbent must stand alone. So how about incumbent mayor? Can he use that? No. Again, incumbent. Oh, I'm sorry. The second choice is mayor, city of Los Alamitos. This is a thumbs up. There was a precedent set for this court case in a ruling um, for Debbie Cook, who was running for a congressional seat in the 46th Congressional District. She was currently a council member that was elected as a council member, but since she spent a majority of her time doing so, the court ruled that she could use mayor, comma, city of Huntington Beach. So she was able to do this, and there is precedent set for that. Um, the last mayor, businessman, is a thumbs up because he is the owner of such and such powers. He can use businessman. Using the word retired seems like a simple word. It should be quite easy to respond to, but it's not always quite as easy as it sounds. The word retired is defined generally um, for use by individuals that have permanently given up their chosen principal, profession, vocation, or occupation. There are several factors that you need to consider to determine if retired may be used as a ballot designation. One of those rules is that if retired does qualify to be used by an individual, it has to precede the words. It can't follow any words, or, and it can't be abbreviated. Um, the common example that we see of this is for uh, members of the military. Let's say there was an army colonel um, that wanted to reference that he was retired. He could not put um, army colonel, comma, R-E-T, period, which is typically used. Um, and lastly, the word retired, although it usually is used as an adjective, it can be used by itself. It can stand alone. Okay, um, Marcia, we have a couple questions here um, that I want to respond to. We have one that says, can they use Mayor Pro Tem? And that's kind of a gray area. Um, we, in the uh, Secretary of State Ballot Designation Regulations, there is a section that says that you cannot use titles of leadership. Right. And, you know, so Mayor Pro Tem might be considered that. But on the other hand, as Marcia mentioned, there was a ruling, uh, the Debbie Cook case, that said she could use mayor, city of Huntington Beach, and mayor is a leadership position. So it's a real gray area. In this case, I think I would uh, suggest that you go to your city attorney and have them make the decision on it. We also have another question that says, can you use retired public works director slash city engineer? Um, no. It's way too many words. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the first thing. They would have to cut it down. And if they got it down to the three-word limit, then you'd have to um, decide on the word retired, whether it meets the criteria that Marcia has just spoken to you about. Another question, can you use the word veteran? And that's an absolute no. And we'll be getting to statuses in a few minutes, and a veteran is considered a status. Uh, if somebody tells me their profession is brain surgeon, is it my responsibility to verify that? Uh, the answer to this is no. Um, you are not an investigative officer. You're a filing officer. So if, if the person writes down on the ballot destination worksheet that he or she is a brain surgeon and gives backup for it, it's not up to you to make that decision. Somebody else can challenge it. That's one of the reasons why we have a ballot destination worksheet now. And it's a really helpful tool because they have to sign that they are qualified under that title. Let's see here. We also have... Um, can you use the word military man? Um, again, we'll be getting to um, military later on. Um, I, Marcia, I, I think misleading. I, I think it's misleading. I think it's 
too general. It doesn't really give any specifics as to, first of all, it just says military. So, you know, military is kind of a, uh, that's a large scope uh, considered in that. So it, it needs to be more specific. It needs to be more definitive. It doesn't really tell you anything about them, really. So I don't think we'd have to ask further questions and have them identify that on the ballot designation worksheet. You know, before we um, move on to our next example, I thought I would kind of give you an example, since we're speaking about the word retired, of um, a candidate that we had in our office recently that wanted to run for county central committee. He wanted to use the words retired professor. Well, he'd only been a, he had been a professor for seven years, but he hadn't done so since 2008. And the first issue that we dealt with is that he looked awfully young, so when we looked at his registration, he was only 40 years old. And the regulations by the Secretary of State um, defined retirement age as 55. Also, he wasn't receiving any retirement benefits. So since he isn't receiving any pension, he must be living off of another revenue stream. After additional conversation with the candidate, we learned that the source of his income is the stock market. So since our candidate did not meet the age requirement, he wasn't receiving a pension, and had another principal occupation, we thought that maybe we should have this definitively responded to by our county council. And we asked them for their advice. They told us that no, this wouldn't be appropriate in this, in this uh, situation. Our candidate really was a former law professor, but since he hadn't been a law professor in the last 12 months, he couldn't use law professor. Um, and you can't use the word former. So he ended up selecting community volunteer as his designation. So this is just kind of an example of how the ballot designation worksheet really helps you as a, a tool in determining whether or not a ballot designation is appropriate. Our next example that I know you've been waiting for since we just talked about retired is a Seal Beach City Council candidate that's 55 years old who voluntarily left her prior position as a teacher, which she held for two years. She now works full-time at a Surfside restaurant. She wants to use retired teacher as her ballot designation. Can she? Or how about former teacher? Well. There's kind of a problem with the both of those designations, and we'll talk about why. Retired teacher isn't acceptable, simply because um, the several factors that we have to use in determining whether retired can be used or not weren't really applicable here. They weren't satisfied. Um, the age, the number of years in the position, and whether or not she's receiving retirement benefits, and the employment situation. She does have another job. She wasn't in the position long enough. Uh, so those are kind of reasons that this one is a thumbs down. And in response to the uh, question B, former teacher, we just talked about this. Um, I'm sure former teacher might be something that sounds a little more flattering, in her opinion, than her current occupation. But it is something that can't be used because she can't use former and she does currently have a different occupation. She would have to indicate that. We have another example of using the word retired in the ballot designation. A Laguna Beach City Council candidate who was 57 years old, voluntarily left his prior position of attorney, of which he held for 15 years, for which he is receiving retirement benefits. Can he use the ballot designation of retired attorney? Absolutely. Thumbs up. The candidate is over 55, held this position for over five years, and is collecting retirement benefits. He's also not working anywhere else, so this would be uh, a very positive one he could use. So let's talk a little bit about statuses. Uh, was, I know it was one of the questions that we were just discussing a couple of minutes ago. A status is defined by the Secretary of State's um, guidelines is a state, condition, social position, or legal relation of a candidate to another person, persons, or the community as a whole. And the next uh, sentence basically 
lets you know why that this is something that they can't really use. Um, it fails to specifically talk about what they do to earn their livelihood, what their principal occupation or profession is. It usually has positive connotations that um, are not necessarily an indication of what they do with the majority of their time. Examples of some of the statuses that we are asked in our office. Philanthropist is one of them. Wife. Patriot. Concerned citizen. Activist. I think we hear that probably more than anything. And a second, a close second to that would be veteran. Taxpayer. Or husband. So we have another example right here that discusses um, the use of the status veteran and references the military. The candidate for Stanton City Council is a decorated Vietnam War veteran who has had a long and distinguished career in the U.S. Army, has the current rank of colonel. Two years ago, he retired from the Army and is currently a strategic consultant for Bomb Tech, a manufacturer of weapon systems that contracts with the U.S. government. Can he use veteran, forward slash army, forward slash consultant? Or can he use retired military, forward slash consultant? And his third option is strategic weapons consultant. So what do we think about those? Well, the first one, veteran, forward slash army, forward slash consultant, is a thumbs down for a couple of reasons. Veteran is a status, so he can't use that. And secondly, he is not the entire army, so he can't use that either. The second designation he requested, retired military forward slash consultant, is a thumbs down. He cannot use retired military because he's not the entire military. Something I don't think I'd really thought about, though, and, you know, when you do think about the definition of the term, he's not, so it wouldn't be appropriate. And sometimes we have to explain that to them. The third request, strategic weapons consultant, is a thumbs up. That's exactly what he does. So that would be an appropriate valid designation. So is he or is he not a community volunteer? This is a question that we uh, respond to frequently in our office. Something that especially during the general election when candidates are running for the school districts that they like, they would like to use. A community volunteer, I'm sure you're not surprised, has a uh, definition by the Secretary of State in their guidelines. It's defined as a person who engages in an activity or performs a service for or on behalf of, and this is the important phrase, without profiting monetarily from one or more of the following, either a charitable, educational, or religious organization, or a governmental entity, or an educational institution. The activity by the candidate must be the substantial involvement of the candidate's time and effort. And here's another important key phrase. It is the sole, primary, main, or leading professional, vocational, or occupational endeavor of the candidate. So that says that they must do that an awful lot of their time and spend their energies doing so. So here we have an example of someone that would like to use community volunteer. We'll kind of give you the scenario here. A Santa Ana City Council candidate, the daughter of a Texas oil tycoon and heiress to his fortune, spends every day from 9 o'clock a.m. to 4.30 p.m. working at her local church. She does not get paid for her work, which consists of providing food, clothing, and other assistance to homeless individuals in the community. She also donates large amounts of money to local charities. She would like to use the ballot designation of community volunteer, forward slash philanthropist. Can she do so? Or what about community volunteer? Well, for the first question, community volunteer forward slash philanthropist, no. I'm afraid that wouldn't work for a couple of reasons. Philanthropist is a status and can't be used. And if they're going to use community volunteer, it must stand alone. So B, community volunteer would be great. That would be a thumbs up. 
She isn't being paid. She spends a majority of her time doing this. And community volunteer is standing alone. We have another quiz here. A Buena Park City Council candidate is the president of the Mission Viejo School PTA. May she use school PTA president as her ballot designation? Or could she use community volunteers? Well, for the first, school PTA president, no, I'm afraid not. Um, she can't use a specific uh, position such as PTA president. And also the word president itself refers to a status, so that wouldn't work on either count. The second question, community volunteer, well, it, it, perhaps it could be used. It kind of depends on if there is another principal profession, occupation, or vocation that should be utilized instead. So um, that's the purpose of the ballot designation worksheet. They put down community volunteer, then they need to indicate why they are able to use that. Okay, let's review. I know we've talked about an awful lot of rules and examples today. Ballot designation should be simply the principal occupation, profession, or vocation of a candidate. There are several rules that must be followed, such as the designation should not be misleading. There is a three-word limitation. The words incumbent and appointed incumbent must be used appropriately. Geographic names are counted as one word. The word retired must be used appropriately. Statuses are not allowed, and community volunteer must be used also in appropriate circumstances. So I thought that we would go over uh, some examples of ballot designations. And if you'd like to read along with me, I'll give you a few moments to go to that hand, the handout icon that Kay mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. And it's located on the upper bar on the right side. It's that icon that has several pages. It's to the left of the word feedback. So if you'd like to look at that list along with me, I'm going to go ahead and read some examples of ballot designations. And that is the name of the specific handout. It's called Examples of Ballot Designations. And before I read things that are acceptable, remember that it's critical that they must be the principal profession, occupation, or vocation of the candidate. OK? The first is city council member, comma, city of Orange. Investment counselor, health care manager, appointed incumbent, community volunteer, businesswoman, forward slash attorney, forward slash councilwoman, CPA, forward slash parent, retired USAF officer, mayor, forward slash physician, city of Lake Forest council member, forward slash educator. I know that might seem like a lot of words, but if we go back to our word count discussion, City of Lake Forest is one word, council member is another word, and educator is the third word. Now let's review some of the ballot designations that are unacceptable, and we'll discuss the reasons why they are unacceptable. The first example is incumbent mayor, forward slash engineer. The word incumbent, remember, must be used as a noun, and it must stand alone. Prominent businesswoman. Now, this can't be used because it reflects a status. Businesswoman by itself could be, if it were the um, principal occupation, profession, or vocation. But we couldn't use the word prominent there. The next example is businessman, comma, father. Now, this one seems like it should be all right. But the ballot designation regulations kind of have a, a guideline as far as how punctuation should be used. And the designations that are combined, that are disparate, should be combined together with forward slashes and not with commas. The only time where it's appropriate to use commas are in examples usually of elected officials' titles. The first example that we used as an acceptable designation, city council member, comma, City of Orange is an example of this. The next example of an unacceptable designation is Republican Legislative Assistant. No party affiliation can be mentioned in a ballot designation. 
The next example is community volunteer forward slash parent. Remember, community volunteer must stand alone. Nonprofit organization founder. This might be something that can be used, but you need to discuss with them how long ago was this organization founded. If it was something that they did within the last 12 months, then this would be appropriate. But if this was something that they did, say, 12 years ago, then they might want to change it to reflect nonprofit organization director. Because technically, the founder was something that they did a long time ago. Victims' rights advocate. This is not acceptable because it suggests an evaluation of the candidate's qualifications. And again, there is a status. Former council member. I can't use former or ex. And I know you will notice that council member is referenced in two different ways. Sometimes it's used as one word, sometimes as two. And I know that there are um, usually appropriate, acceptable ways of presenting this. Um, and either one is fine. Veteran. That one comes up a lot, as I said, and it is a status, so it can't be used. And the last example is Army General, comma, R-E-T, period. That's the last rule that we just discussed with the word retired. It must appear before the other words, and it must not be abbreviated. So when will the candidate's chosen ballot designation not appear on the ballot? Well, there is a, a very definite, simple response to this. When a ballot designation worksheet is not completed, all the information on the worksheet must be completed. It is basically for their protection. It is not a form that is optional anymore. I know a few years ago, we just used it when we thought that there might be um, something that needed clarification or maybe a little documentation on the part of the candidate. It is no longer an optional form. It is a mandatory form. It is required if a candidate wants to have a ballot designation appear underneath their name on the ballot. And this is an image of the ballot designation worksheet. This is the current version that the Secretary of State uses. It's pretty much the same as the um, version that we used in 2008. With a couple of differences, but the primary places on the form that are, are real critical to our topic of conversation here today, the proposed ballot designation. That needs to be something that is a mirror image of what they put when they complete the affidavit of nominee and oath or affirmation of allegiance. In our office, we encourage them to complete the first and second alternatives just as a backup. Um, this is in case there's a challenge to their designation. Then the portion that says to describe why, what you do and why you believe you're entitled to use this designation is something that we have them fill out in entirety, not just something very basic as, as teacher. So if they wanted to use a designation teacher, we would ask them how long they've been teaching, what subjects they teach, where they teach, things of that nature. And again, it's just something that backs up their validity of the requested designation. So what happens if they don't complete the valid designation worksheet? This is the consequence of submitting a designation and not submitting a ballot designation worksheet. On the ballot, you see the candidate's name, and there is nothing referenced underneath their name. So if they don't complete that form, then they won't have a designation there. And importantly, when you are transmitting over your documents to our office, the nomination documents, um, that affidavit of, of uh, nominee, that lets us know how the candidate would like their name to appear on the ballot and the ballot designation they'd like. If you would be so kind as to please transmit that ballot designation worksheet to us, we would appreciate it. We keep it on file, and it basically is backup or justification for our allowing it to be printed on our ballots. I would like to thank you for your time and your attention, and I'll now turn the presentation back over to Kay. Thanks, Marcia. I know this is a lot of information for you to remember, so I want to mention several resources that you can use in making a ballot designation decision. 
Election Code Sections 13107, 13107.3, and 13107.5. Those are the code sections that deal with ballot designations. There's also the ballot designation regulations prepared by the Secretary of State. This is a handout that we're providing you, and it was the basis for our presentation today. Um, recently, these regulations were revised by the Secretary of State last December, and the handout that you are receiving today is the revised regulations. And of course, last but not least, your city attorney. Um, if you have a gray area, uh, like we were talking about a little while ago, that mayor pro tem issue, it's best to seek legal advice. And when we have a problem, we go to our county council, and in turn, we go to your city attorney. We do have one other question here. Um, it's do current incumbents or appointed council members need to submit certificate of election with ballot designation worksheet? And the answer to this is no. All we need from you is that ballot designation worksheet. Any questions or comments, please feel free to contact either Marcia or me. Here are our business cards with all our contact numbers. And as I mentioned earlier today, uh, we will be giving you several handouts, and you need to um, hit the icon in the upper right-hand corner of the screen right next to Feedback. You'll see the menu with the five uh, handouts. You can just click on those and download them. Uh, the handouts are the ballot designation regulations. There are two examples of acceptable and unacceptable ballot designations. One is what uh, Marcia covered in the review period. Uh, the other one is uh, um, we cut on one sheet the questions and the thumbs up and thumbs down answers that Marcia did with you during the presentation. So they're all on one sheet for easy access. Also the ballot designation worksheet and then our PowerPoint presentation. So thank you so much for joining us today. I, I hope that you found the time well spent and that you did learn a lot. And we definitely w would like to hear your comments. So please take a moment to complete a brief survey. The, uh, just go to www.ocvote.com slash lm slash surveys.htm. And once you're at that site, then you can click on Ballot Designation Survey. It's just a short survey. You can complete it online and then submit it to us. So it shouldn't take you too long. So thanks again. Take care.